Welcome to this exciting course called A Panorama of the Christian Church. In it, we're going to see a big picture of what God has been doing throughout the ages among his people and through his people to build his kingdom and form a new people made in the image of Jesus Christ. We haven't always been perfect, far from it sometimes. But in the end, God's kingdom is being built, will be fulfilled, and people will be redeemed, and God's plan will be carried out to the ends of the earth. I hope you're ready for this, and so let's get started. I guess the question we're really asking is, what in the world has God been doing for the past couple of thousand years? That's going to be the focus of our course, the works of God through his people called the church to redeem the world. We're going to see some of the big picture items like uh, some of the great figures, some of the great movements, and some of the great events. In this first part or first session, we're going to be talking about the establishment and growth of the church from 30 to 313 AD. Some people might ask, well, why look backward at what God's been doing at all? I mean, isn't the future forward? Aren't the issues that we have to solve right now? Why spend any time looking backwards? Well, because Christians often know very little about where we've come from, and we can't learn from previous mistakes if we don't know where we've come from. So I like this cartoon by uh, Charles Schultz, Peanuts. Maybe some of you remember the Peanuts cartoons from many years ago. And there's um, Sally and Charlie Brown. Sally's having to write an essay for school on church history. And she says, when writing about church history, you have to go back to the very beginning. Our pastor was born in 1930. And truthfully, <laughs> as funny as that may be, that's about as much as many Christians know about church history. They just know their own church. They just know where their pastor came from. They don't know much about what happened before or what happened in any other place. That's not true of everybody, but that's sometimes true of uh, the average Christian. As I mentioned, we look backwards so that we can learn the mistakes that people have made in previous ages. We don't want to repeat those mistakes. So the best way to not repeat them is to learn from other people's mistakes, previous generations' missteps. Also, we often fail to see how God is fulfilling his promises. We think God's not at work when he is at work. It's just not according to our specifications and our timetable. A knowledge of church history can show us that God actually does fulfill things, but it's in his time and in his way. And also, we may be tempted to give up or to give in when our triumph is imminent. In other words, sometimes we're on the verge of success, but we just give up because we don't have the perspective that, that would motivate us to carry on, even past the time in which it looks like anything reasonable is going to happen. So, again, church history shows us that God shows up at the oddest moments, sometimes at the very last minute, and we need to hold on. We're going to see in this first session that God is going to build the church and establish it. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said that on this rock, I will build my church and the very gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, nothing can stop his plan. Maybe people will cooperate, maybe they won't. But if one person doesn't cooperate, others will. And that's a major message. In this period of church history, there were three major hurdles that the church overcame between 30 and 313 A.D., and they are going to be that the church resolved some key issues, that there wasn't really clear or specific Bible instruction about, but that were issues in the early church, and God said that he would send his Spirit to guide us into all truth. The church also survived persecution, heavy persecution. The Roman Empire at several points was determined to wipe out the church, and the church survived and actually grew. And the church spread the good news throughout much of the known world at the time. So they overcame all of those hurdles and obstacles. What are some of the key issues that the church also resolved? What is the church? Who are we? Are we Israel? Are we not Israel? We're not all Jews now. We're Jews and Gentiles mixed together. What are we? What's the mission of the church? What are we supposed to be doing? Yes, we're supposed to spread the good news. Yes, we're supposed to love each other. But what does that look like? Who may be included in the church? Again, 
originally the, the earliest Christians were all Jews. In fact, it was kind of mind-blowing to them that anybody but Jews could ever follow Jesus as their Messiah and the Savior of, of the world. And so when the Gentiles became a part of it, they, they were really quite surprised, and they had to deal with that. And then what books do we accept as Scripture? Um, we accept the Old Testament, of course, because the early church started with that. As Jews, they started with the Old Testament. But what are these new books being written by the apostles and other people associated with apostles and, and other people that just claim that they have insight from God? Which ones of those books are we going to accept as Scripture alongside the Old Testament? So those are some of the issues that the early church had to resolve. With that in mind, let's proceed in some detail in seeing how God established his church. So what is the church? Well, the church is the body of Christ that's under a new covenant, not the same covenant that God made with Israel under Moses at Mount Sinai, but a new covenant in Jesus' blood made up of all people, not just Israelites, all people who have put their faith in Christ throughout the ages from the time of the resurrection until the present day. This new covenant is recorded in Luke 22, verses 19 through 20. It says, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. A new covenant with new symbols for a new people. Another issue that I mentioned, what is the mission of the church? Well, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in other words, we're to make disciples. What is a disciple? He says disciples are the salt of the earth. That's Matthew 5.13. He says that, it's, that disciples are the light of the world. That's Matthew 5.14. Another issue that I mentioned was who may be included in the church. Well, the earliest followers of Jesus, as I mentioned, were all Jewish. Within a decade, however, the church had to face a crucial decision. May Gentiles be included in the church? Gentiles are anybody who's not a Jew. And if so, under what conditions may they be included in the church? Very, very important. Remember that in Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter was absolutely astounded that God would actually save these Romans, these Gentiles. And yet he became the one who had to go back to the rest of the Jewish believers and say, look, how can we keep them out? God has already allowed them in. And so over the next chapters in the book of Acts, the church had to deal with that issue. So in Acts chapter 15, they arrived at a decision that Gentiles could be included in the church on exactly the same terms that Jews had been included in the church. And that is by faith in Jesus. That you didn't have to be circumcised and in effect become Jewish first that you certainly could become a Christian right from where you are. However, they were told, please don't bring any food been sacrificed to idols, food that's been killed in ways that are repulsive to Jews, and, so, and, and leave your sexual immorality outside. You can't bring your idol worship or your sexual immorality into the church. But other than that, you come in just as the Jews did, by faith in Jesus. That's in Acts chapter 15, 19 through 21. So Gentiles must be accepted on the same basis that Jews are because now God saves everybody equally. That was the whole purpose of Israel, was to bring the world the Messiah and the scriptures and to provide the opportunity for Gentiles to come to know the same God that Israel had come to know. They will not be required to undergo circumcision, but they will be required to abandon their idol worship and their sexual promiscuity. They have to leave that behind. Another issue, what books do we accept as scripture? They had the Old Testament, which is what they started with as Jewish believers, but there were new books being written by the apostles recording the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There was uh, the book of Acts, which talked about some of the early history of the church. 
And then there were letters like Romans and Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians and some of the others that explained what it means to follow Jesus Christ in a world that's really hostile to him and, and what it means for Jews and Gentiles to get along together as a new people. So all of that is important. And they, they finally settled on 27 books that would be alongside the books of the Old Testament. As I mentioned, the church began with the Old Testament, and the earliest Christian preaching and teaching focused on how the Hebrew Scriptures proved that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. Lots of people claimed it. Jesus was actually the Messiah of Israel, and it could be proved from the Scriptures. That he was also God in human flesh, that somehow God had taken up residence among us as a human being, and that he made the ultimate sacrifice for sins and then physically rose again. So to follow Jesus was actually not to go against Judaism, but to be a fulfilled Jew or a fulfilled Israelite. So the church recognized the new inspired books, as I've mentioned, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, Acts, the Letters, and Revelation. These books explain how to live under the new covenant with God through Jesus. How did they arrive at those 27, though? We know that there were books like the Didache, which uh, Christians found helpful. There were other letters like First and Second Clement that the church thought were instructive. There were also some heretical books like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Barnabas that they knew were very fishy, very strange. So how did they choose the books that were actually inspired? Well, they used these guidelines. First of all, the book had to be authentic. They had It had to be clearly a book written by a real Christian. It wasn't a forgery, you know, somebody writing in Paul's name, but it wasn't Paul. Somebody writing in Peter's name, but actually it wasn't Peter. So the book had to be the real deal. It also had to be written at least under apostolic sponsorship. If it said Peter, it had to have Peter as the author, okay, or Paul. But a book didn't have to be written by an apostle. It could be written by an associate of an apostle under their sponsorship. For example, Mark. Mark was not a, an apostle, but he was writing under Peter's sponsorship. Luke was not an apostle, but he was writing under Paul's sponsorship. So these were well-known people. They were well-referenced, well-connected, and, uh, and well accepted as great leaders. Is the book consistent with other scripture? In other words, it, it's got to go along with what we already know is scripture. It, it can't contradict currently understood books of scripture. Is the book widely used among the churches? In other words, it couldn't be accepted by one or two churches. It had to be accepted by all the churches. And at this point, there were Christians spread out from Probably there were a few in Britain, just a very tiny amount in Britain at this point, all the way to India, South India. And when they were able to get Christian leaders together, those Christian leaders had to say, yes, we're using this book. We accept it as scripture. We, we recognize it as scripture. And then does the book have life-changing power? It's got to be able to change your life. It's got to be able to shake you up. It's got to be able to turn you around. It's, it's got to have that kind of supernatural life-changing power. Here's some applications. God always gives his people wisdom to solve problems. Always. He said he would send his Holy Spirit to guide us into truth, and he has been faithful to his word to do that. We now benefit from the early church and how they resolved key issues in, in telling us who we are, helping us understand who we are as God's people, understanding what we're supposed to do, understanding who can be in the church, and understanding what our guidebook is, the scriptures. James 1, 5 through 8 tells us, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Another accomplishment of the early church was that they survived persecution. Not only survived it, but actually grew and thrived under persecution. So there were several main periods of persecution. Uh, in the beginning, the earliest persecution was from Jewish leadership, because all the early Christians were Jews, and they were preaching something that the Jewish leadership thought was 
blasphemous. The Jewish leadership had decided that Jesus was not the Messiah, was not the Son of God, but was dangerous. And the early Christians were Jewish, and they were promoting Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. So, naturally, the Jewish leadership persecuted the early church. And that lasted maybe six to ten years, something like that. We don't know the time span between the day of Pentecost and the, the time in which the church grew beyond what the Jewish leadership could, could deal with. But the Jewish leadership was led by Saul of Tarsus, who later became the famous Apostle Paul. During that time, hundreds, maybe thousands of, of Christians were killed. Some were imprisoned. Um, some lost their livelihoods, um, you know, injury, all of that sort of thing. It was pretty bad. But the main periods of persecution then happened under the Romans. Roman persecutions were periodic. It wasn't the whole time from 30 to 312 A.D., but there were times when Rome really tried to crack down on Christianity. And, and during that time, Christians were never particularly popular with the official government or even with the general population. But for some reason, they continued to grow, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. There were three periods of very severe persecution under the Romans. Nero was severe in the first century from about 64 to about 68 AD. Unspeakable things were done to Christians. They were tied to posts covered with paraffin and lit as tiki torches for Nero's parties. They were thrown into the arena and torn apart by wild animals, you know, all sorts of things, just unspeakable things. Then that kind of died down for a bit. And in the third century, 249 to 251, Decius again tried to exterminate Christianity. I think the Romans tried it and then they kind of gave up for a while and then they thought, oh my goodness, this is getting out of hand. Um, and so they would crack down again. So Decius was one of those crackdown periods. Then that died out after several years, and then Diocletian made one final attempt to exterminate Christianity between 303 and 312 when he stepped down, and the next year Constantine legalized Christianity in 313. So why were the Christians so hated? Well, for one thing, they refused to participate in state-sponsored idolatry and emperor worship. Every year, every Roman citizen was required to appear before a public official who had an, uh, an altar of incense burning, and they were required to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord, or Caesar is basically God. And, it, you know, they weren't expected to necessarily worship Caesar every day, but they were expected to at least acknowledge that Caesar was the supreme word, the supreme authority. And the Christians just wouldn't do it. They just said, no, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. The Christians just wouldn't do it. They said, no, Caesar is not the ultimate authority. Jesus is the ultimate authority. Jesus is Lord. We will be good Roman citizens. We'll pay our taxes, but we're not going to acknowledge Caesar as God. Other accusations against the Christians included the idea that Christians were atheists. Now, that may sound rather ridiculous, but but since the Christians said to the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and other peoples who had many different gods and goddesses, hey, these gods don't really exist. They're not real. They, they're not true gods. Then they were considered atheists. Now, we know that Christians believe in one true God. Of course we do. But from the point of view of the Romans and the Greeks and the other nations, if you don't believe in the gods, well, then you're an atheist. They were also accused of gross immorality. Christians called each other brother and sister all the time. And sometimes when they would appear before a Roman magistrate, for, for example, to get married, the Roman magistrate would ask, well, <clears throat> who are you? And he would say, "My, you know, the young man would say his name. And who is this young woman? Well, she's my sister. She's sister so-and-so. And of course, the Romans thought, well, that's incest. You can't marry your sister. And of course, you know, Christians would explain, but, you know, when you want to believe something bad about somebody, you're willing to believe almost anything. Also, every time the Christians got together, they had what they called the love feast. And we would call it today a church potluck or a church dinner, something like that. So the church, the Christians would get together, they would worship, and then almost every time they would eat together, they would share their food. They called that the love feast. Well, the Romans thought, well, you know, certainly they're not just eating. They must be doing something else. 
Because the Roman and Greek mind was highly sexualized, they interpreted all of those things in the worst possible way. So they were accused of gross immorality. They were having orgies in their worship, according to what the Romans and the Greeks thought. But also they were accused of cannibalism, because every time they got together, they would eat somebody's body and drink somebody's blood. And even as depraved as some of the Romans and the Greeks were, that was a step too far. So even with all of those false accusations, the church not only survived, but it grew rapidly. And we'll find out why in the world it would do that in just a moment. But first, let's get some application. God always gives his people strength to persevere through trials. And the Christians did. Oftentimes, if, if they were offered a choice between saying Caesar is Lord and death, they would choose death. It says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He always gives us strength to persevere. He always gives us strength to do the hard things that we must do, even the fun things that we must do, he gives us the strength. It's, it's all from him. So the church spread the good news throughout much of the known world. You can see that the central location there is Judea, Jerusalem. But from there, the, the church spread out, spread to the north into Asia Minor and Syria. It spread to the east all the way to southern India, but also into Persia. It spread south into Ethiopia and Egypt. And it spread west along the coast of North Africa and into Italy and Greece. And even in the first century, it was probably all the way into Spain and southern Britain and parts of France along the riverways in southern France. So the Christians were very busy doing what they were told to do, which is to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. How did the church spread so rapidly? Even with all of the accusations, the false ideas about Christians, why was it that they were able to get their message across and people wanted to become Christians, wanted to become this disliked group of people? For one thing, the gospel is a very simple message and the church taught it very clearly. It's not rocket science. If you want to come back to God, if you want to find the Creator, then He'll take you back through Jesus Christ. It's very simple. Some years ago, I was in charge of adult ministries at a large church. And in that church, we were approached by some group homes of severely uh, mentally disabled people. And the group homes asked us if we would put together a Sunday morning service for these severely disabled adults. And we're not talking about moderate learning disorders. We're talking about severe, not able to function in society kinds of disorders. So at first, we tried to mainstream these adults. That didn't work. They, they were noisy. They, they couldn't, you know, really, they couldn't quiet down. They couldn't really be part of the service. They were too disruptive. So we found a classroom and we designed a service and a class just for them where we could focus on their needs. And so we did that. And so that forced us to think, well, what do you teach somebody who's severely disabled mentally and emotionally? And we decided that it was the same thing that you would teach a two or three year old in Sunday school, that God loved them very much, that he sent Jesus to die for them because he loved them so much, and that if, if they wanted to, they could love him back. And so we would organize our lessons around those very simple points. And in a way, that's what the gospel really is. We make it so complicated sometimes, but the reality is that God will take you back and he's done everything possible to bring you back. All you have to do is say, yes, please forgive me. I've been away from you far too long. I'm coming back and then come back with all your heart. That's all it is. So the church taught that message very, very clearly. Christians treated people fairly and fostered a sense of belonging. You might be a slave in ordinary society, but you could be treated as an equal. You could be loved as a brother or a sister. And if you showed leadership potential, you might rise above even those of higher social classes who were in the church, because it was all about ability, all about calling. Christians also cared for the unwanted and the neglected. 
in those days, um, sons were greatly valued by families, but a lot of times daughters were not, especially if you already had several daughters and here comes another one. You might just put her in a box and take her down to the marketplace and say, anybody want her? And there were two kinds of people. I mean, of course, childless people might adopt a daughter like that. But the two main groups that adopted people were the temples of Venus, who would raise the little girls for prostitution, and the Christians would take them in as daughters. So after a while, it was kind of interesting that the Christians ended up with a surplus of women, and the non-Christians had a deficit of women. So a lot of times a young man who was looking for a wife couldn't find one in the pagan population, but he would he would meet a Christian girl and then he'd have to talk to her family. A family would say, well, sorry, young man, our daughter is not going to be seeing anybody but Christians. And this young man who might not have listened to the Christian message under any other circumstances suddenly became all ears because he was interested in the girl. And I know that, you know, people can be converted for the wrong reasons. <clears throat> And not be truly converted, but sometimes these young men actually went, oh, now that I hear the message, it sounds good to me. And then the gospel is truly good news because it offers hope. It does. You may be a slave in the worst possible situation, and yes, your life may be horrible, but you at least have eternal life to look forward to, that God is going to accept you, your sins are forgiven. And you're going to be his son or his daughter forever and ever and ever and reign with Jesus Christ. And, and God does offer hope in this life, too. Sometimes they held out for amazing things and people prayed for them and, and God answered their prayers. So it was, it, was, it was all a very positive thing that people eventually said, wait a minute, I, I think all of these things that people say about Christians are really slanderous and they're not even true. And so I'm going to listen more closely to the message because these are good people and they have a good message. Aristides the Apologist said this, and he was, a, he was a Christian. He said, Christians do not commit adultery, nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle, nor covet what is not theirs. They do not worship idols and whatever they don't want others to do to them, they do not do to others. They do good to their enemies. And, and he wouldn't have written this if it were not largely known that that was true. Obviously, there are exceptions to that, and, and in that day there were exceptions to it, and this day there are exceptions to it. But in that day, people couldn't deny that for the most part, this is how the Christians lived. They lived exemplary lives. So here's the map of the Christian spread from Jerusalem down in the lower right corner. The orange areas represent areas that by 200 AD were pretty heavily Christianized. You see uh, central Italy. Naples area, both are heavily Christianized. You see parts of France, parts of North Africa, parts of what we would today call Turkey, but then it was Asia Minor, parts of Greece. And by, by 200 AD, this was the spread of Christianity because even under persecution, it gained quite a foothold. Now look what happened in just 200 years. This is 400 AD. The Roman Empire is now heavily Christianized, all of it including areas outside the Roman Empire, which would be Ireland and Scotland. They never were. Britain was, Ireland and Scotland were not. And we don't show, like, Ethiopia on this map. We don't show South, South India on this map. We don't show Persia on this map. Those areas would also have some orange areas in them. So what was God doing in the world during this time? Well, he was establishing his church just as he promised that he would. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, it's not Hades trying to break into the church. It's the church beating down the gates of death and rescuing people. Matthew 16, 18. Here's another application. Jesus promised to be with us as we spread the gospel to the very ends of the earth. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 20. And we can see that he was with the early church just as he said he would be, that no matter what persecution they suffered, no matter what hardship they were up against, that Jesus was with them and he blessed their efforts to reach people. And I think we as Christians in the 21st century need to remember that, that God will bless us, that God is with us, and that if we're faithful, people will respond to the message. Our churches will gain disciples. We just have to want them, you know. We have to want them really bad. 
Um, sometimes we don't gain disciples because we don't care that much. But if we're faithful, God will bless us. All right, in the next session, we will start part two, and that is the building of the church from 313 to 800 AD. Look forward to that time with you.